My name is Brian Chapman and I'm the provost here at the University of Houston downtown and it's my privilege and quite an honor to welcome you to our campus to attend the Strength in, in the Face of Challenges Symposium that's been developed by the Center for Family Strengths here at the university. This symposium has been a long time in planning and I particularly want to thank those of you who have been involved in the planning process. I'm especially thankful for the extra work y'all have gone to to arrange the weather that we're having this week <laughs> just for this conference. That is an outstanding accomplishment. The title Strength in the Fa Face of Challenges is a very appropriate title for this symposium in this time. I think at no time in the recent past have families faced so many challenges and I applaud you for the work you do in assisting families and assisting society in dealing with the challenges that families face. Thank you very much for what you do, and I hope you have a great symposium. Again, welcome to the campus. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chapman. We appreciate your support and your uh, being here at the University of Houston downtown. Uh, my name is Alvin Salee and I have the pleasure of serving as the director of the Center for Family Strengths at the University of Houston downtown. And I was so thrilled that we were able to have the UHD jazz band under the direction of Dr. Robert Wilson and his wife Julie Wilson as a lead singer. <laughs> and I thought it was just wonderful that we would begin this general session with music because music is so central to many of our families. And we'll see it central in our keynote speaker today's family as well and part of his experience. Uh, the other thing that I thought was wonderful was to notice the diversity and the cultural background of the jazz group, that they came from literally all over the world to join us today at UHD. And to, it helps uh, me understand and reflect that the Houston area is very diverse, it's very cosmopolitan, and it's not at all like you often see in national ads and so forth. It's really a great community that embraces families. I always like going to the airport and they talk about different things in Houston and one of the things they have listed as being very important in Houston is family. And I think that throughout this conference uh, you'll see that reflected as well. Um, I also wanted to mention that if you didn't get enough, and I certainly didn't, of the jazz band, that they'll be performing at uh, Kima uh, September 17th and 18th. And this particular set they just played, the last place they played was at the French Council here in Houston. So I think we're very, very pleased that we were able to hear them today. Also, there are many, many people to thank and, and help make this uh, symposium possible. I certainly want to thank again the provost's office, the Pre President Flores's office and his staff that he made available, our college and uh, other deans and colleges throughout the university that have supported the conference, uh, and particularly our student staff, Latoya and Myrna just worked so hard, and Courtney, I'm sure all of you, <laughs> yes. Many of you, I'm sure, uh, were quite familiar with them and all the detail work that they were able to do. I also wanted to mention that I think the theme um, this year, strength in the face of challenges, when our board, who is so central in planning this um, symposium, came up with this theme last year, I didn't realize that it would have quite the ring that it does now. Uh, families are faced with challenges, and when we talk about families, we really talk about the community as well. And I think when we need to challenge things, we often need to maybe challenge our policy makers as well as uh, family members. As, and one of the things I hear over and over again is, well, we have to have cutbacks because of the budget, or we have to limit programs uh, to children and families because of the state is poor, the country's poor, and we're broke. This is the richest country in the history of the world. 
this is one of the richest states and, and, and if the state of Texas were a country, we'd be one of the richest countries in the world. It's not that we're broke. It's that we are choosing as a society not to spend money on keeping families together. We are choosing not to put money into education, into higher education. It's a choice. Uh, we are not broke, believe me. When you look at the amount of money that is in the stock market or sitting in bank accounts right now, it's trillions of dollars. So I think part of the challenge is for those of us to challenge those in power, those who are making the decisions not to fund programs that are preventative in nature, that keep families together, and let them know, we know there's money. We are choosing not to fund these programs. So I think when we talk about challenges, that's going to be one of our major ones. Now families, uh, all of us have fam a family of one type or another, and families come in all different sizes, shapes, and uh, mixtures, uh, blended families, uh, biological families, extended family, kinship family, foster family, adoptive families, there are many, many types of families. And I think that, that part of the reason I'm so thrilled that we have Dr. Roger Friedman here today is because he has strong family roots in Houston. And while he works in the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area, he has strong roots, as you'll see, in Texas as well. When we talked about a keynote speaker to open this symposium, I think all of us agreed on the planning committee that we needed somebody that had a vision, that could look down the road quite a ways and help us understand what we need to be doing now for families. And that person is certainly Dr. Roger Friedman. Um, he has been way ahead of the curve for many, many years. He first consulted in Texas in 1994 when uh, we first got the Family Preservation and Family Support Program up and running and has continued to work in many states, as you see in the program, uh, Georgia and Maryland, Arkansas, throughout this country where he has worked not only at the clinical level, one-to-one -one with families, but also at the program level and the policy level in helping us design and understand how we can better try to keep families together in most cases. We can't keep every family together, but in most cases we can. We've developed that technology and Partly through what Roger's done, through our research, uh, we are able to document that we've developed the technology to keep families together. One of the things the center is doing is in partnership with Children at Risk and the Texas Medical Center Library is the Family Preservation Journal is now the new uh, Family Strengths Journal, and it will be available online. Our first issue is coming out in November. And so we have 20 years of research and program evaluation that tells us we know how to keep families together. And when we hear, well, but you can't just throw money at everything. No, maybe not, but it sure helps. <laughs> it hires workers, it provides training, it uh, allows people to come to uh, symposiums such as this. It funds student scholarships to help them attend school. So money is important, but we do have the research and we have the technology, and we'll be able to continue to develop that through the Family Strengths Journal. And I do want to say, uh, kind of on a personal note, that uh, over the last 20 years or so, that. It, I've known Roger Friedman, I've become uh, close friends with him. And that's not always the case, those of you in academia know, when you co-author articles and so forth with other uh, colleagues, you don't always end up as best friends. <laughs> but I could tell you that uh, I'm very proud to say Roger Friedman's my friend. He's a gentleman and a scholar, Dr. Roger Friedman.
Let's see. Alvin, thank you. That was very kind. In uh, March of this year, I got a call from Wendy Steiner, who said she wanted me to see her son. I have an active clinical practice in Maryland. She was referred to me by a mutual friend who was a retired child protective service worker in Silver Spring. And he had told her that I was the best guy in town to work with angry and lazy teenage boys. <laughs> and I said, I'll take that. That's a good thing. That's a compliment. So I asked her a little more about the situation, and the more we spoke on the phone, the darker the drama became. Uh, her son, James, had been adopted. He'd been placed in foster care when he was nine years old. His father had been abusive to his sister and his mother, and he had gone through two foster homes before they had adopted him three years ago when he was 12 years old. She said he could be a good kid, but she couldn't take his abusiveness with her, the nasty language he used with her. He was in the ninth grade now, just about to fail most of his classes, and she had given up trying to motivate him. He slept a lot, played video games constantly, wouldn't really work hard at anything, and she said she needed a lot of help. The only strength I could draw out of her during the phone call uh, was that James seemed to like baseball and that his adoptive father, Paul, uh, coached the team and James got to pitch and play first on it. But even here, this overwhelmed and very well-meaning adoptive mom said, even here she said that James was too lazy to practice. And so he never got really better, never got to hit, never hitting better, never pitching better. So let me just give you a little aside. I um, play in, over 40, in an over 48 men's baseball league. And the name of the league is Ponce de Leon, which some of you may remember from the mists of your literary past, uh, was searching for the fountain of youth. Um, I still pitch a little bit. I have two weapons in my arsenal, slow and slower, as we say. Um, but with all of my experience and degrees as a therapist, there's really nothing like uh, being able to talk easily about two-seamers or four-seamers or uh, circle change-ups to impress a 15-year-old baseball player. So that's how I got started, and I figured I could connect with this kid. So James is 6'1", he's very skinny, he's got a long, sad face. Uh, he's wearing a kind of too large white t-shirt when he comes in, black basketball shorts, and new blue Nikes. He lives in a solidly middle-class adoptive home. Paul's retired from a, career, from a career in the Postal Service, and Wendy works as an accountant with a small nonprofit in, in Washington, D.C. So why am I telling you this story? And by the way, using fictitious names. Because not only is it a way to explore the challenges of our work with kids like James and their adoptive or foster families. But there's something very iconic about this case. It's a window into how our welfare system works, how it creates problems by relying so strongly on the removal of children, on foster care. And even if the youngster is lucky, as in James' situation, adoption. James' presenting problem is largely a iatrogenic problem. Iatrogenic is a public health term that describes illnesses that you receive from the process of treatment. So when you go in a hospital for surgery and you contract pneumonia, that's a classic kind of iatrogenic disease, iatrogenic illness. The treatment in James' situation 
involved removal from an abusive father and alcoholic mother to a foster home at age nine. Being thrown out of that foster home and one more, before 13, he was finally adopted by Wendy and Paul. Some see the child welfare system as analogous to a cliff. On one side of the cliff, above the precipice, the safe side, there is foster care. And there is ultimately adoption. But if you look over the cliff, down into the precipice, you see the dark sort of endless hole of children returning home or being left uh, with, their, with their, their own parents. Some policy leaders, media folks, lots of politicians, much of the public, see child welfare and foster care and removal of kids in this way. They see it because the only harm really visible to them is when there is too little intervention. So when a child is injured at home. So the, let me say that again. The only harm that they is really visible to the public, to the media, to politicians, is when there is too little intervention, when a child is left at home and re-abused. I don't think of the child welfare system as a precipice. I think a better metaphor is a tightrope. One can fall off in either direction, by leaving a child in a dangerous home, or by removing a child to a series of stranger caregivers when a little support and patience could have helped them stay in a safe and loving home. We need to identify the risks, the errors, in both directions to try to shed some light in how this tightrope works. We need to be committed to the challenge of a differential response to different levels of risks. And we need to continue to commit ourselves to what the facts show that kids generally do better in the short run and the long run when they remain with people and in schools and environments that they know. And if removal is necessary because of chronic or toxic patterns of interaction with their parents, then relative or kinship care is the next best option. But most importantly, and this is what I'm going to talk more about with James and his family, the child and the caregivers or parents need help in changing a victim and offender pattern in their family. And this change comes from helping them in a, in a family-based way, finding the strengths in the family that help them set aside this destructive pattern and establish new ones. That's when the child has the opportunity to re-engage in life fully, learn how to manage stress without resorting to being a victim or an offender, and the parents learn how to help him feel safer and trust that even after traumatic experience, life is worth living. So let's get back to James. As a family-centered therapist, I know at some point I'm going to have to invite Wendy and Paul, his adoptive parents, to the sessions. But if I move too quickly before I've engaged him, I'll lose him in the inevitable challenges and the conflict that's going to happen when I gather the family together. Wendy blames James for everything. James blames Wendy endlessly. I know they're all contributing to the conflict, to his laziness, to his anger. I've got to help them shift that pattern. And if I don't, I will be another helper in the long list of iatrogenic helpers that entered this family with excitement and optimism and confidence, but left shortly with them disappointed again. So the repeating pattern of victim and offender, withdrawal and disengagement from life, it's also, those of you that have worked with traumatized kids know, um, that it's typical even of so-called successful foster care and adoptive placements. It's a part of the invisible harm 
of what advocates like Richard Wexler calls stranger care. This repetitive pattern is not altered if this repetitive pattern of abuse isn't significantly altered by the time the youngsters in young adulthood, the adult product of this helping system will obviously repeat the pattern in their own lives. I'm concerned about the harm that James will bring in 30 years when he has children if we can't help him change the pattern now. And we all should be concerned, all of us that work with families. Do I need to remind you that people with childhood histories of trauma and abuse and neglect make up almost our entire criminal justice population? Physical abuse and neglect are associated with the highest rates of arrest for violent assaults and offenses. 75% of perpetrators of child sexual abuse report that they themselves had been sexually abused during childhood. The tendency to repeat represents an integral aspect of the cycle of child abuse, of violence in our society, that we as helpers must have the strength and humility to face, regardless of which side of that tightrope the child falls. Are you all with me in this? This is important. So let me give you a few other facts. Every year there's about three million children reported to authorities for abuse and neglect in the United States, of which there's about a million cases of abuse and neglect that are substantiated. Across the state of Texas in 2010, there were almost 300,000 ch 300, children reported and around 100,000 substantiated investigations. This, by the way, is up 25 percent, up 25 percent from preceding years. In the Lone Star State, almost 28,000 kids were in substitute care on August 31st, 2010. And of these, 80 to 85 percent were in stranger care. The remaining were in kinship care. To get a feel for the dimensions, because these statistics, these numbers kind of hide things. And think about it this way. This auditorium holds about 300 people. So if we had about 10 of these auditoriums side by side with every seat occupied by a child, that would represent the number of kids in foster care in Texas in August of last year. And let me add one other little aspect to this image. 50% of those kids are going to be under nine years old. So let's get back to James. James was nine years old when he was placed in his first foster home. After three or four sessions of talking baseball and pitching tips, I finally asked about his birth mother and what happened to get him removed. Without any emotion, he tells me he saw his father beat up his mother. Uh, his father made him watch while he repeatedly raped his older sister for more than a year. He was seven years old, he thinks, and his sister was 13. He said his mom was an alcoholic and tried to help but couldn't do anything. And she's still a drinker, and now she's homeless. How does he know this about her? I ask him, how do you know? He says he meets her once a month. They have lunch at the Red Lobster right near my office. He uses his allowance money to pay for it and buy her lunch. And they talk, talk about her life, they talk about it, what his sister's up to. He says his sister is doing better. I ask, how is she? He said, well, you know, she ran away from four foster homes. She aged out of the system, worked as a prostitute for about a year, and now she's doing better. She's living in a women's shelter. She joined AA. She's getting her GED. He's proud of her. 
I ask if he's told Wendy and Paul about how his mom and his sister are doing and what they think. And uh, James says, yes, he's told them. He knows, they know that he meets with, her, with his mom. Uh, they, say, uh, they say that's up to him. They're not going to uh, stop him from doing it. But they don't want him to talk about his mom or his sister around the house. They say for good reason. It not only upsets them, but they don't think it's healthy for him to be preoccupied with his mother's problems, which he can't help anyway. She's got to stop the drinking. She's got to get shelter. Little did they know just how preoccupied James was. He tells me then one of the reasons he doesn't do his homework or pay attention to school. Because he says he's not motivated. He says he wishes he could be motivated. He said sometimes at night he prays if God could do one thing to help me, to motivate me, get me going. He says he often sees mental pictures of his father abusing his sister. He says his dad, he sees this picture of his father beating his mother. He zones out. This happens in school. It happens in the bus. happens at home. He says the only time he's not liable to have these flashbacks is when he's sleeping. Sometimes it helps to play video games. And always when he's pitching on the mound, whether they win or lose. To the entire world, James looks like an average, tall, lazy, underperforming, angry, sad, sullen teenager. But he's really a war veteran. He's really a soldier that's been through an incredible series of wars. He's neurobiologically wounded. His limbic system is like a tuning fork that got wrapped so many times when he was growing up that any trigger now wraps it again and he's hyper aroused. It's worse than being a war veteran. Because as a kid you can't go AWOL. You're dependent on the offender. You have to organize your life around living it. In fact, there is a debate now in the field of trauma that the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder that we're so aware of and is such an appropriate sort of assessment of syndrome for returning veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq fits well adults but doesn't really fit complex developmentally traumatized children for the reasons I mentioned because they can't leave the environment, because they are trusting and dependent on the caretakers that are abusing them, which is about 80% of the time. And because they have to then find emotional and psychological ways to organize their life to survive in that environment. So Wendy had called me for help with her lazy and angry adoptive son, and after a while, what I get to see is a seriously traumatized adolescent whose internal life is almost entirely preoccupied with worries about his mother, his, with memories and flashbacks of what he experienced, what his sisters experienced. So they want him to do homework. He wants to be sure he has lunch next month with his mom and can coach her a little bit and can maybe slip her some money if she won't drink it up to give to his sister and he's concerned. This is a 15-year-old struggling with the challenges of, of adult manhood. Now, he's not motivated to, to get the homework done or to play catch with Paul in the backyard or to work on his pitching or hitting. Come on. The games are good because those are times when he doesn't have to think about stuff. So now we're ready to invite Wendy and Paul to the family meeting and begin some of the face-to-face -face work. Well, so let me cut to the second or third family meeting. James is sullen for the whole time. He makes no eye contact with anyone in the room. I wonder if he's already flashing back and, or he's just zoning out. I try to calm Wendy down, encourage her to criticize a little less, uh, speak in a less critical tone. 
Paul remains silent as always. But I can't get James to speak up, to be his own advocate, to say anything other than Wendy drives him crazy and she's always yelling at him. This is another adaptive behavior on James' part, another iatrogenic, adaptive kind of behavior of traumatized kids that we as helpers need to come to understand and be patient with. And that is the fear, the fear of experiencing and articulating anything real about their abuse or about the pain that they're feeling in the ongoing family. I'll say more about that in a minute. James has lost any expectation that anyone will protect him. He's disoriented by the stress in the room. He's preoccupied with his anger. He's wondering how in the hell he got himself in this position. Not in the position of being adopted, but in the position of being in this room, you know, where there is this therapist that's getting into heavy stuff. And Wendy and Paul are there. He now expects rejection. All this discussion I'm leading them into will end in his getting kicked out again. So let me say that again. All this discussion I'm leading them into, his fear is I'm going to get kicked out again, as he was from two previous foster homes, for fighting too much with his foster parents or fighting too much with one of their own kids. This ugly, repeating cycle of getting victimized, being rejected, no one being will to hold him. Can't we just stop talking about this stuff? He's trying to avoid just the experience I'm trying to enact because he fears that he won't be able to control himself if he gets drawn into this discussion. That the old traumas will feel reenacted and that he'll do something that he'll regret that's horrible. To Wendy, to Paul, or to me, he'll say something, or he'll stand up and he'll storm out and slam the door, or he'll throw something. He doesn't trust at all his emotional ability to manage this. So as helpers, we've got to realize that the kids who have been traumatized that we're working with organize their relationships around prevention of abandonment or a victimization. So his whole life is organized around not talking about this stuff. He doesn't want to be abandoned again. He doesn't want to be victimized again. However, unless he can expose himself a little bit to this challenge, it is going to continue to dominate his life and will then be what leads him into destructive relationships and continuing the abuse in 30 years when he's, when he's a parent himself. So some of you who know or have read or are familiar with DSM-4, you know there's a term for this, reactive attachment disorder. That's great. But such sort of clinical terminology doesn't help me, doesn't help Wendy or Paul, and for God's sakes, doesn't help James. It doesn't help us get out of this bind in the room. This is the bind, to remind you, this is the, the hidden destruction of the alternative care system. Is there going to be headlines in the post tomorrow about this? <laughs> no. But if a child is at home and is re-abused, there will be. And social workers' heads will roll. And an executive director of an agency might get fired before she fires the social workers, right? So this is not very sexy stuff. It doesn't sell papers. And, and again, it is hidden, which is why it's so important for us to keep it in mind. So James expresses his fears of abandonment and of victimization by how? By being defiant with Wendy, by being a jerk with her by distrusting the family, the adoptive family, and by a code of secrecy and silence about his pain that would make um, the Sopranos proud. All right? So at the center of therapeutic work with terrified kids, 
or teenagers. The challenge is to help them and their parents or caregivers realize that they are prone to repeat these patterns and that the child is prone to freezing when under stress, just like James is freezing in this room with me and Wendy and Paul. Freezing any time a discussion or a flashback gets him close to the bone, you know, gets him close to, to the heart of the matter. These kids avoid engagement with family members or any helpers, no matter how good they are, teachers, coaches, ministers, therapists, because any interaction could unexpectedly turn into a traumatic trigger. And they'll act out. They'll make the bad situation even worse. This is the atrogenic lessons of James's life. So during the family meeting, I don't know what the hell to do. I realize the dilemma that we're in. Um, but I have to challenge. I have to stay with it. I have to have strength myself that James can respond differently this time. So I say that it feels like there is a wall, a thick, concrete wall between his mom and James. And I reach out in the air and I sort of draw an image of this, this, draw an image of this wall between the two of them. And I say that neither of you can get around it or can get over it. And everyone is silent. And I turn to James. And I try to make very sympathetic eye contact with him. I move a little closer to him in the room. And I say to him gently and softly, James, how you deal with this wall now is really important in your life. I know you want to get married someday. I know you want to be a much better father than the father you had. And I know that you want to care and protect, for your, protect your children. But if you can't deal with this wall right now, you'll never be able to have all those good things in your life. James glares at me. I'm just hoping there's enough discussions of baseball and pitching tips in the bank that he's not going to tell me what a jerk I am. Oh, it's, it's fascinating what happens. He glares at me silently and for a long time. And finally, very softly and somberly, he says to me, You got it almost right, but not quite. And he went on, that wall isn't between her and me, he says. That wall is around my heart. And he draws a circle around his heart, like this. So like you, I am struck with his strength, with this simple eloquence. I've thrown a challenge into him that ultimately I thought was the harsh truth of his life, hoping that he could, by exposing himself to that challenge, respond in a less reactive, mature way. But never did I think I would hear the kind of courage or honesty or insight that he shared. So Wendy's taught, so he said this, And then he was quiet, looking at Wendy and waiting for her reply. Her angry face now fell. She began to cry. Her husband, Paul, reached over and put his hand on her knee. The whole, the whole room softened. James remained sitting forward on his seat, totally engaged, alive, kind of, for the first time that I've seen him, looking at Wendy and waiting. Well, I knew enough to shut up, you know. The family needed to find a new pattern, and they needed to do this without my interruption. So I sat quietly, resisted my instincts to try to 
actually at that point feeling quite sympathetic towards Wendy. Um, also resisting my instincts to walk across the room and shake hands with James and tell him how proud I was of him. All of these interactions making me too central. I've got to let the families process unravel. So the mom, Wendy, says through her tears to James, eye to eye, so I'm not the reason you're so angry at me? And James says, well, sometimes you are. <laughs> and he laughs. But most of the time, I can't trust anyone, and I haven't been able to for years. And you just need to live with that. It doesn't mean I don't appreciate all that you and Paul do for me. I actually like living with you guys. It's a hell of a lot better than anything I've had before. But I'm not going to be able to be the lovey-dovey kid that you thought I might be or that you want. That's just not me. I can't be. That meeting was in the early part of June. And I saw James individually about a week ago, before Labor Day, a few days into the new school year. So he shows up. He's got a crew cut. He's wearing matching blue T-shirt, blue basketball shorts, and those same sort of neon blue Nikes. You know, matching is a big deal in high school, and he's paying attention to it now. He shakes my hand. He plops down on the sofa in my office, and he says, so how'd you deal with that little earthquake last week? <laughs> I don't know if you guys read about it. We had a little earthquake in the D.C. area. I laughed. Um... He says school's starting off pretty good. And then he says, did you know I was a good speller? I said, no, I didn't know. So I'm always up for a game, and I wanted, to, I wanted to sustain this positive engagement with him. I didn't know where it was going. So I said, let's have a spelling bee so you can show me how good you are. All right, he says with a smile, I'll give you the first word. <laughs> I, said, I said, all right. This is why it's good to see adolescents, like late afternoon when you're getting tired, you know, they'll keep you awake. <laughs> he thinks for in a minute and he says, okay, anthropological. So I look at him and I say, James, you're killing me. He says, all right, well, you said you'd play. So I have to slow down, think about it a little bit. I'm a pretty good speller too, you know. So I spell it out slowly. He says, good, you got it. Uh, and then he says, all right, give me one. Well, now I'm torn. And I guess you can suspect what my internal tension is. Um, do I make it easy so he gets it right? If I do that, he sniff, he'll sniff that out in a minute. And he'll know that I don't have any confidence in him. I'm just playing a game. If I make it hard and he can't spell it right, will he feel too defeated and crushed? Well, what the heck. I knew that James was being real with me, so I was real with him. So I said, okay, how about analytical? And he kind of rolls his eyes at me and says, say it again. <laughs> so I say it more slowly, trying to pronounce each syllable. Analytical. So he thinks about it a minute. He spells it back one syllable at a time, and he nails it. <coughs> the challenge for us as helpers is to educate ourselves about the neurobiological challenges that trauma renders in children. And how to use what strengths they have to create positive experiences to help them and their families or caregivers bond more deeply. This symposium is full of workshops 
that will help you learn to do just that. And once we know that, we need to find the strength and the patience to help terrified kids like James and their families, whether they are at home or in kinship care or happen to be in foster or adoptive care, to develop the capacity to focus on their strengths and to focus on having fun in life. Child abuse and neglect may be our biggest public health problem, but the truth is we have the knowledge and we have the skills to resolve it. We know how to prevent. We're even learning, as I'm sharing with you, more and more ways to intervene, to help stop that pattern of organizing and the way these kids tend to organize their lives around fear of repeating patterns that may be present in their past that are very embedded in their hearts. You know, you can tell when kids change, when that wall around their heart starts crumbling, and when the caregiver or the parent stops being so reactive and as Wendy did and feeling like she's the one that caused all this and, and how unappreciative James is, you can tell when that starts changing. And you see it in people's behavior. People start crying, they laugh, they tease, and yes, they argue. They're no longer frozen. You know what I mean? There's no longer that sense of cold freezing and being unable to speak or talk. There's no more reliance on fleeing. James doesn't storm out of the room, neither does the mother. The mother doesn't stay at work. Wendy doesn't stay at work till 10 so she can avoid having to, to interact with this kid. There's no more of that reactive fighting where James calls her horrible names and Wendy says, I'm done with you. And there's no longer freezing. There will be tears, there will be arguments, but there will also be laughter and love. The cycle is broken. In that moment, in the room, the cycle was broken for James. And a safe enough space got established for a moment within those family members and between them, for all three, Wendy, Paul, and James, to look at James' traumatic past without having to repeat it. This is our biggest challenge. And don't be fooled by the so what I think of as kind of the red herring debate between family preservation or foster care. It is a tightrope with dangers on either side. And holding kids in their old homes and around people and environments and schools they know in the long run, all of the data shows us this is better for them. But it's hard to remember that when the most visible tragedies come from little intervention. So part of what I hope you can take from this presentation today is the hidden injuries of foster care placement can be 30 years down the road and will be 30 years down the road a very devastating contribution to this cycle of abuse and neglect and violence that's plaguing our kids and our families. So help where you can. If you're involved in working with uh, abused kids or their families, get educated about this neurobiology. And pay attention to these issues of traumatization, even when kids look on the outside to the whole world at they're pretty normal, just troublesome. And understand that our goal is not just safety for James now, but if we are true helpers, we're helping him break that cyclic pattern that 30 years from now will fill up the foster homes, fill up these auditoriums again long after all of us are here. So let's work on stopping that together and let's have the strength to face that challenge. Thank you guys.
Thank you.